Well, this is November 25th, 2006. On the American calendar and on the Hebrew calendar, Kislev 4, 5767. So we've, we've entered a new month on the Hebrew calendar. I've entitled my message, Old Wineskins. And um, I want us to start off by reading the three passages in the Gospels where Yeshua uses uh, this particular illustration or analogy. We first go to Matityahu, Matthew chapter 9. <coughs> Verses 14 through 17. Each of the, uh, the gospel writers uh, share this particular event a little bit differently from one another. The details are just how they saw it, how they interpreted what happened. Um, uh, the details of them were a little bit a little bit different. There is um, there is some you now when we get to Luke, there is some debate. In fact, uh, most scholars believe that Luke was not a um, first-hand witness of these events, but that these events were told to him, and he recorded them. And so you'll see, when we get to Luke, um, his, is, his account is quite different um, in some areas than uh, Matthew's and Mark's account of this particular thing. Um, <clears throat> so we begin with verse 14, chapter 9, Matityahu. Next, Yochanan's, uh, speaking of Yochanan Hamatbil, or John the Immerser, Yochanan's Talmidim, his disciples, came to him and asked, Why is it that we and the Perishim, the Pharisees, fast frequently, but your Talmidim don't fast at all? Yeshua said to them, Can wedding guests mourn while the bridegroom is still with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast. No one patches an old coat with a piece of unshrunk cloth, because the patch tears away from the coat and leaves a worse hole. Nor do people put new wine in old wineskins. If they do, the skins burst, the wine spills, and the wineskins are ruined. No, they pour new wine into freshly prepared wineskins, and in this way, both are preserved. Now let's turn over to Mark chapter 2. Verses 18 through 22. 18 through 22. Mark 2, 18 through 22. Also, Yochanan's Talmidim and the Perishim were fasting, and they came and asked Yeshua, Why is it that Yochanan's Talmidim and the Talmidim of the Perishim fast? But your Talmudim don't fast. Yeshua answered them, Can wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is still with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, fasting is out of the question. But the time will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and when that day comes, they will fast. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old coat. If he does, the new patch tears away from the old cloth and leaves a worse hole. And no one puts new wine in old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the skins will be ruined. Rather, new wine is for freshly prepared wineskins. <coughs> and now, finally, let's turn over to Luke chapter 5. 
And this is where we're going to settle. This is where I'm going to preach from. Luke chapter 5, verses 33 through 39. Next they said to him, Yochanan's Talmudim are always fasting and davening or, or praying. And likewise the Talmudim of the Perishim, but yours go on eating and drinking. Yeshua said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is still with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and when that time comes, they will fast. Then he gave them an illustration. No one tears a piece from a new coat and puts it on an old one. If he does, not only will the new one continue to rip, but the piece from the new will not match the old. Very different, isn't it? Also, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does... The new wine will burst the skins and be spilled, and the skins too will be ruined. On the contrary, new wine must be put into freshly prepared wineskins. Besides that, after drinking old wine, people don't want new because they say the old is good enough. So you can see the differences in the way that these, uh, the story is told. I will be pulling concepts from the other passages, but I mostly want to take a look at the way that it's written, the way that it's presented in Luke. Um, if you'll notice in verse 36, Yeshua makes the statement, or the Scripture makes the statement, that He gave them an illustration. Now, that that calls us or hearkens us back to what he was talking about previously. He's giving these stories, these parables or whatever you want to, however you want to say it, as illustrations for what he had said previously. And so many times I have looked at this particular passage of Scripture and scratched my head. Because what does... What does a coat being patched and wineskins, you know, old wineskins have to do with the fact that the, the Talmudim of Yochanan and the Talmudim of the Perishim are fasting but yours don't? And the story of, you know, when the bridegroom's here, uh, you don't expect the guests to fast. And... It was really interesting this week because when I when I asked the Lord what I was supposed to share with you guys, He just kept saying the name of this message. Old wineskins. And I knew this passage and it was like, oh God, you've got to help me because I just don't get it. Well, He helped me get it. And, um, you know, but it wasn't, it's not just for me. I mean, he didn't, he didn't help me get it just so that I could, I could understand it. The purpose is to share this information with you because you need it. And, um, so, what does this mean? Bridegroom and wineskins. Well, in order to answer that question, we have to take a look at what Yeshua's visitation, what is coming to earth, meant. Um, and, and I'm not talking in the broad uh, spiritual um, meaning, necessarily. You know, we, if, 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 we, if we separate ourselves from this Passage, and we just ask the, the question of, like a Christian, what did it mean for Yeshua to come? You know, you're going to get all sorts of answers to that question. 
But we need to take a look at what it meant to these people at the time that Yeshua was living. Why did He say this to these people? He, they understood what He meant by the illustration that He gave. We may not understand it, but they, they did. And so we need to find out what it meant. Well, let's take a look at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44. Very um, well-known passage for us. Rick, this um, the sound is still a little bit hot. Every time I speak, it kind of rings up here. I don't know if anybody else can hear it, but I can, I can certainly hear it. Uh, chapter 19 of Luke, verse, beginning with verse 41. When Yeshua had come closer and could see the city, the city being Jerusalem, Jerusalem, He wept over it saying, If you only knew today what is needed for shalom or peace. But for now, it is hidden from your sight. For the days are coming upon you when your enemies will set upon, will set up a barricade around you, encircle you, hem you in on every side, and dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls, leaving not one stone standing on another. And then this last phrase, I don't know what translation you're using, but mine has a hyphen at this point. So there's a pause, and Yeshua says, and all because you did not recognize your opportunity when God offered it. In the King James Version, it says you did not, something like you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Or what... What version do you have? Me? Yeah. King James. King James. What, it, what is it, how does it say in King James specifically? Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Yeah. Because you didn't know the time of, of your visitation. Well, I want to take us to, to a couple words in Greek. I was wondering when I read this, because again, the Lord led me to this scripture. And as soon as I read it, I knew in my mind, even though I was reading it in the uh, complete Jewish Bible, I knew what it said in, in the King James Version. I knew that it used the word time. And so I was thinking, I wonder if this is kairos in Greek. And so I looked it up and sure enough, the word here in Greek is kairos. And Kairos is a special word. It's not the typical word for time in Greek. The word, the word kairos means a window of opportunity. In other words, a window opens and it closes. And so while the window is open, you have to do something during that period of time. If you don't, then the window closes again and sorry, it's over with. You lost your opportunity. And, you know, in the complete Jewish Bible, he renders it very well by saying, you did not recognize your opportunity. I, I, would, I would love if he had said, your time of opportunity because that would have been actually a better way to say it. Your period of opportunity or something of that of that nature because the whole concept is that it's, it's just a short period of time and you have to take advantage of it. And then I want, I want to explain to you the word visitation or... Um, 
And he words it, you know, a very different way here. Uh, recognize your opportunity when God offered it, but the word for visitation in the King James Version is the Greek word episkope. And you'll you'll recognize that that word as the the root word for episcopal or or, or episcopate. Um, the reason for that, the reason why that that word is used uh, today, is because episcopate um, means inspection for relief. Inspection for relief. In other words, um, let's say you have, uh, in today's terms, let's say you, you've heard about, you're, you're part of an organization that gives relief assistance to people that are in poverty. And you've heard through the grapevine that there's some remote village and all the people are dying from starvation and, and poverty. And so you're sent by your organization to go inspect that group of people to see how you might be able to help them. So it's inspection for relief. So what Yeshua was saying to them was, you have squandered the window of opportunity where God sent His inspector to look upon the situation to determine what kind of relief could be brought to your situation. And instead of understanding and accepting the relief that was handed to you, offered to you, you have mistreated the, the inspector. You have said, I don't want your I don't want what you have to offer, the relief that you want to give. And so, um, that is a very key understanding for us today. Because we have got, you know, we understand uh, from, from what our scripture says that Yeshua, that wasn't the last of Yeshua. We're going to see him again. He's going to visit uh, the earth again. And this time, there's going to be, there will be relief. There will be relief given to those who are worthy of relief. But at the same time, there will be punishment given to those who are worthy of punishment. He will be coming in a very different manner um, than He did before. But before He comes physically as, as uh, the King, the one who takes His throne in Jerusalem, I believe that there, and I, and I believe that Scripture supports the notion and the idea that there will be a spiritual visitation of Yeshua before He actually physically comes. That there will be a window that is opened during which He pours out His Spirit afresh on mankind in a way that actually never has been done before. So, going back, let's, let's backtrack back to this whole concept of, of the Talmudim not fasting, the bridegroom, bridegroom being present being the reason why, and then what this has to do 
with that. The statement, the reason why he brought this up, the, these illustrations up, was he was trying to make a statement to the people that were asking the question. He was trying to make a statement to them that you do not see and understand what is happening. You don't understand my visitation. You don't have any idea why I'm here. And therefore, you don't understand why my Tommy Dean, why my disciples don't fast right now. Because you don't, you don't, you're not getting the concept. I'm here to bring you something. And you're not ready. You guys are old wineskins. You're patched, you're brittle, you're hard. If I give you what I have to offer, you're not going to be able to handle it. The wine that I give will be ruined, and you'll be ruined. You're not going to be able to handle what I have to give. You know, in one of those passages, it, it took, in one of those previous passages, not the Luke passage, but it talks about <clears throat> taking unshrunk patch and putting it on an old coat that has a hole in it. And how when that piece shrinks, it'll just rip away and make the hole bigger and worse. This was a statement, really, in, in a way, many times the statements of Yeshua sounded extremely harsh to when we read it. Uh, because we don't understand the illustrations and the way that those illustrations were given back then to people. But this was actually a statement of mercy to these people. He's ba he basically is saying to them, I would love, you know, in, this, in the passage where he comes to Yerushalayim, he's weeping. He's weeping over the fact that they don't understand what has just been presented to them. And he's making the statement to them, look, if I were to give you what I want to give you, you're, you can't handle it. You're not ready for this. I'm offering something new, but, they, but what I have to offer has to be put in a new container. The wine, in this case, is the new thing of God that God is bringing, offering. The old wineskins represent the old ways of doing things, of understanding things. And the only way for us to be able to, and I'm, I'm not only talking about past tense, I'm talking about present tense and future tense. The only way for us to receive what Yahweh is going to want to give is for our old wineskins to be transformed. For there to be a softness and a suppleness. See, what happens with wine is as the wine begins to ferment, it gives off gas. And if you, if you put wine that is still in the process of fermenting, because there, when you ferment wine, you add yeast and sugar to the wine. And it starts a process of the process of fermentation. There comes a point in time where that fermentation process stops. And, and the wine is then um, ready, or you know what they would consider done. And so after that, it's not going to continue the process. The only thing that it will do from there is as you expose it to more to air and bacteria and so on, it will turn into vinegar. But the, the wine making process is over with at, at some point in time. 
And so, if you took an old wineskin that was brittle and maybe patched, and you put new wine in there before it was finished with its fermentation process, it would burst that skin because the skin would not be able to stretch with the fermentation process. And obviously, you know, the, the, uh, the unstrung cloth versus the old cloth, that's self-explanatory. We understand about that. But both are pictures of the same thing. The issue that he was saying, the, the message he was giving to them was, I have to be able to put what I have to offer in something that will be able to expand and grow with what I'm doing. Now, One of the first things that we do as human beings when we hear a message like this is, what do I got to do? I'm going to run off and do all sorts of things to try to make myself a new wineskin so that I can receive what God has to offer me. Guess what? You can't. You can't. If you're brittle and you've got patches all over you, you're not going to be able to fix that. Not by your actions, not by your choices. The only one who can make you, transform you into a wineskin that can be able to receive new wine is Yeshua. He has the ability, we don't, to take something that's old and brittle and patched and make it, transform it into something brand new. Make it soft. Make it supple. It's really interesting that at the end of this particular passage in Luke, uh, the one in Luke chapter 5, verse 39, there's an additional statement there. And I don't know. I, I, I don't know whether Yeshua actually said this and the other guys left it out, or, you know, if in the storytelling, this is the way it was told, and Luke just recorded it this way, and Yeshua didn't actually say it, but it's very apropos. I mean, it goes along with what Yeshua was saying. After drinking old wine, people don't want new because they say the old is good enough. It was... Their idea of wine, what was good wine, was different than our idea of what good wine is today. The wine connoisseurs of our day, if you go talk to them, um, they're going to, and you ask them for a good wine, they're going to want to present to you something very dry, uh, something that is at the end of its uh, fermentation process. Uh, dry and not sweet. Um, but at this, at this time, uh, in this culture, uh, new wine was what people were after. It was the sweeter wine. It's, it's the wine that is just at the beginning of its ferment, fermenting process. You'll, you'll remember the story of Yeshua turning the water into wine. And um, you know that the, the indication there is that 
it was new wine as opposed to the stuff that had been given previous to that and tasted much better as far as they were concerned. And so, uh, you know, to say, to say this, besides that after drinking old wine, people don't want new because they say the old is good enough. Now this isn't talking about, um, this isn't talking about like, I had a glass of wine yesterday and I'm saying that the old is good enough for me and I don't want your new, your new wine. This is talking about people who've already, who are, are intoxicated by the old wine. Okay? And, and so when the new is given, by the time you get to that point, it's like, I don't really care about, about whether you're giving me new or whatever. The old's good enough. I'm, it's doing the job. You know, I'm getting my, I'm getting drunk off of the old stuff, so I don't think you're new stuff. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, in fact, you know, that was, that was the point that was made at the wedding at Cana. When Yeshua turned the water into wine, the comment was made, why did you save the best wine until last? Because now everybody's already had way too much and they're not going to be able to really enjoy this good stuff. Uh, you normally serve the good first and then by the time they get drunk, they don't care whether you serve old stuff or not. So, but as far as spiritual uh, illustration is concerned, you know, this is pretty, the statement is pretty obvious. People that are intoxicated on the old stuff are going are gonna to say, I like the old, I don't need anything new. I like the old way of doing things, you know. But as we take a look for us, with Yahweh about to do something new. You know, we've got to ask the question of ourselves. Will these wineskins hold? And, um, you know, I think a, a lot of us in this room can look at our lives and we can know and, and understand that there's an awful lot of patches on our wineskin. And uh, some are dry and some are brittle. And some of us are at that place where we say, eh, I like the old. It's good enough for me. I don't... I don't need the new stuff. You always have the option to say that. But you'll miss out by saying that. And so the Lord is, you know, asking, are you willing for me to do whatever is necessary? in your life, no matter how how painful it may be, for me to transform you into a wine skin that will be able to hold the new thing that I'm about to do. Are you willing for me to reweave your life into a new coat? Because just by taking a new piece of cloth and putting it on what's there, the old, it's not going to work. I can't, he says, I can't do that. I'm sorry. 
I can't do it not because I'm mean, not because it's the rule. I can't do it because it would be damaging to you. It would be damaging to you and it would waste what I want to give. Don't cast your pearls before swine, the scripture says. The reason that it says that is because a swine can't appreciate a pearl. They have no concept. It goes right over their heads. And so, Yahweh is about to come a new visitation, a window of opportunity, and offer something to us as the bride. But the skins have to be ready to receive. If there's anything that you feel like you need to do, the thing that you need to do is run to God. Because He's the only one that can change your situation and make it different. Let's pray. Oh, I remember growing up growing up in churches where Christianese cliches were tossed around with great nonchalance without care for an individual and uh, when people were suffering when people really need help needed help so often when they tried to go to someone to receive that help, the person would just say, well, the answer's in God. And Abba, I hope that the people in this room understand that that's not what I'm saying, not the way I'm saying it. But that statement, no matter how trite, no matter how empty of compassion it might have been given by those whom I encountered in my younger days, nevertheless is a true statement. The answer to everything in our lives Every issue, every problem is found in you. And the problem, the fault is not with you. It's with us. Quite often we Tell people around us that we want help. Quite often we tell people that we want change. But when the rubber meets the road and we are faced with the opportunity to actually do what's necessary to change, we backpedal real fast. And there's a lot of reasons for that, I understand. We all have been through things that were difficult for us to handle, that we couldn't handle sometimes.
I also understand that many times, uh, like I was praying at the beginning, we feel unworthy to come to you. We feel just so dark and so black that we surmise and presume that you don't want to have anything to do with us. That we're just too dirty, too messed up. But Abba, I know you. And I know your word. And I know that that's a lie from the enemy. A lie that he gives to us, that he whispers into our ears from the time that we're a little child. Because if we will believe that lie, then we will stay away from the one person, the one source for our freedom and our redemption and our transformation. I also understand that we all know that the old adage, no pain, no gain, holds true when we come to you. You want to transform us, you want to redeem us, you want to change us. But quite often there is pain involved. And we don't want to suffer. We don't like pain. And so sometimes we avoid it at all costs. But you gave a promise. You said that when we pass through the fire that you'll be with us and that it will not consume us. You've told us that when we have to traverse the waters that you'll be with us and they will not drown us. They will not overcome us. we need transformation we need renewal we need to be made into a container that can handle what you want to give Abba, all I can do as the under-shepherd of this congregation is to pray and to ask that in your mercy and in your compassion that you would work with all of us here to bring us to a point where we willingly surrender to you and allow you to do what it is that you need to do. That we're willing to obey your commands without hesitation. Making the declaration to you. Though you slay me, yet will I praise you.
Father, give us what is necessary to pass through the fire. To endure what pain may come. To be transformed into the spotless bride. In Yeshua's name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevaret Adonai v'yishmarecha Yair Adonai p'nav alecha v'yikunecha In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.